Great, I'm gonna start recording this. Right, I think that we will get going and I'm sure people will join us. So for those of you that just joined, uh, you're very welcome. My name is Becca. This is our Zoom webinar on diversity and inclusion, decolonizing peace building. We're really, really happy to have you with us. So we are recording this and we'll be uploading it to our YouTube channel. So it is up to you whether or not you have your video on or off. Um, you can help us out by muting your mics until we have a group conversation a bit later. If you want to see all of the lovely faces that are part of this, you can click in the top right hand corner and you can click gallery view and you'll be able to see a little bit more of, of who is with us, which is great. Um, you can use the chat function if you need to, uh, if you have a question or if you're having tech problems, you can drop it just to me. Um, and uh, you can message me directly or you can message so that everybody can see. Um, you'll only be recorded if you speak or share. Um, that will be the ones that are recorded on video. And as with all of our Zoom calls at the moment, this is you know an experiment for us in using this technology. And we ask that you join us in a spirit of trying these things. And we are, we are seeking to create brave spaces with these uh, types of conversations. So we ask that you enter in with a spirit of empathy and with curiosity. And we just want to reiterate that everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter if you're here because you work in this field or it just piqued your interest or you're stuck at home and you have nothing else to do. Um, so all ranges are welcome here. And I'm really looking forward to the part where we all get to express some of how we feel. So just to give you a little bit of a brief um, intro to me and St. Ethelburgers, and then I'm going to hand over to Natalia. So we um, at St. Ethelburgers, we're a Center for Reconciliation and Peace, and we operate from four core values. The first is that we try to find the opportunity in crisis. The second one is that we seek to protect the sacred. The third is that we build community across difference, and that's difference of faith, of background, of religion, of gender, everything. And the last one is that we seek to put our values, whatever they may be, into action. So that's the place that we're coming from. My name is Becca, and I'm the Community Reconciliation Program Manager. And the way that we're going to run this webinar today is I'm going to ask Natalia some key questions and give her about 20 or 30 minutes to answer those and then I'm going to open it up to the group um, for further questions and any comments and, and I'd love to have a great discussion with you all. So Natalia, hello, welcome. You, I'm in southeast London, you're in west? West. Yes, northwest London, great. Um, so just do you want to give just a little brief background of who you are before I ask you my first question? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see you. See so yeah, everyone turned out today. Um, I'm Natalia Nana. I am a diversity and inclusion consultant. I have worked in the NGO sector more recently for about five years and before that with teaching, working in peace building with young people, um, which was so fun, and multi-faith and race relations work back in the early 2000s. It all started with the Bradford and Oldham riots that happened here in, in 2001. So when I graduated, I sort of went straight into yeah, community reconciliation work and race and community work and yeah, really opening my eyes to how you can have a melting pot that's still segregated. Mm. Yeah, amazing. Um, so to start with, I was just wondering if you could talk us through, well, that's some of your personal experiences working in, in DNI, and i um, but just some of your experience of working with the current models that we do have. So if you wanted to, to share a bit about your personal experiences and working in our current models of peace building. Gladly so. <laughs> we had this conversation and I was just ranting away. It was fine. Seeing 30 faces now is slightly more sabering. Um, but it's interesting because I think it's interesting even the way that you set this call up of saying, um, you know, we need to be brave, we need to be curious. You know, it saddens me that we need to say this. And I think even just that introduction, that, that, un, that even unintentionally, unwittingly reveals so much about this sector, actually by the fact that we would need to preface it. You know, this is a really soft sector, which is doing hard work, 
which is a juxtaposition that I don't think people find easy. Um, it's a white sector and it's, it's ironic working in an international NGO sector that is working with majority world, working with brown and black people, almost run exclusively by white middle class people in, in a few Western countries. There's just something really odd, really unsettling, really unsafe, really unhealthy about that. And the fact that calling it out sort of feels like the kid calling out the emperor's new clothes. I'm like, wait, can, ev can everyone else see that he's got no clothes on? Is it, just, is it just me and my other brown friends who are like, wait, this doesn't see, I, ooh, I don't, mm, this doesn't seem right, but it must be right because it's, it's not being questioned. It's, it's just normal. You know, most diversity inclusion initiatives are run by white women. Okay. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. I'm half white, so I can't be racist. Um, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. But there is something deeply insidious with that not being questioned. And that, to me, is the concern of this sector. You know, it's the whole notion of charity. To be honest, it just pisses me the fuck off. It pisses me off because... It's not aid, it's not charity. I'm half English, I'm half Ghanaian. I'm incredibly privileged. I despise the notion that my country needs Western aid. My country was fine. My country has wealth. My country has resources that you can pick up out of the ground. White people came to my country, stole, raped, destroyed the country to build up their countries. And then now we have little 21 year olds going on gap years to go build a well, getting to feel good about themselves and feel that they're contributing something meaningful. I very much just feel that it's, it's, it's as if I threw, it's as if I'm here in my home and we're safe and I'm, I'm hunkering down and I'm so privileged. I have a home, I have a garden. And it's as if someone bursts into my house, brings all their friends and destroys the house. We're talking like, you know, the film House Party back from the 80s? We're talking like house party style. Destroys the house, trashes it, steals the projector, the laptops, the printer, the quinoa from the, from the, you know, from the cupboard, everything of value. The toilet paper, you know, they steal everything of value. And then I'm left in this wreck of a home. They're walking past being like, oh, it's such a shame that that brown woman doesn't take care of her house properly. You know, it's such a shame that they just can't take care of their houses. What I'll do is I'll encourage my children to go and help the brown woman clean up her house. She really needs the help. I'll do that solid. You know, I'll do that. I'll do that kindness. Aren't I so great? I just get to feel so charitable about myself. The whole notion of charity, I think, is insidious. I think it's dangerous. I think it's disruptive. I think it's disreputable because it's fundamentally wrong. It's not about charity. It's about justice. You know, the, the, the white-dominated countries have done an injustice to the world. Mm. And the notion that then we get credit is just so so wrong so i just feel fundamentally uncomfortable with the charity sector sector wide and then there's another level of discomfort with the ngo um <clears throat> dni field where actually it's so unequal there's such a lack of equity such a lack of awareness um and it's still so dominated by white capitalist colonial power mm. That's my short answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. And thank you for your honesty, Natalia Nana. I really appreciate that. Um, so you've spoken into some of the limitations that you're, that you, from your personal experience and the limitations that you have felt and experienced. Is there things that encourage you about the diversity and inclusion sector, like what's happening in that sector at the moment? Anything encouraging? doesn't have to be, but if there is. No, move on. But no, that's not true. Um, yes and no. Like so much of this, this work, you know, diversity and inclusion, so much of it is about sitting with grey. 
And that again is something that people find incredibly difficult, which is why I think in part I'm so good at it. I think it comes in part from being mixed race. I've, I've grown up with difference. I've grown up with being othered wherever I am, even in my own home. There's no one in my household or my brother, but there's no one who looks like me. I don't look like either my parents. So there's an inherent acceptance of difference and otherness that I carry in my work. And, and, and so much of inclusion work is having to sit with that, having to sit with the absolute despair of white feminism, the absolute despair of white fragility and male fr fragility, and the fact that this work is so undervalued. You know, you see, you see what people value by where they spend their money. And the fact that this work, there'll always be one D&I worker, there'll be one person, one project, and it'll have like a two year shelf life. That's very discouraging. It's discouraging that I graduated back in 2001 and I'm still having the same conversations. My mother was working in race equality back in the 80s and I see the same faces and I hear the same, the same, the same concerns being raised. But what's encouraging is that actually we're no longer just having those spaces in our lunch breaks in the brown corner. You know, I'm having those conversations with CEOs. I'm having those conversations with leaders who don't get it, aren't doing enough to try and get it, but on some level want to get it. And that's really the start. The fact that, you know, this can be a mainstream conversation now. The fact that every organization worth its salt has a diversity inclusion strategy or an approach or is on its way to doing so, you know, that's encouraging that it's coming out of, out of the corners and into the middle. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that is. That is really, really exciting. Um, and, I, and I think one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is because, because it's coming, you know, rightly so, uh, more central and hopefully for more sustained, is that we are then looking at our framework going, oh, hang on a second, maybe this framework is, doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to just zero in on the peace building and reconciliation with the earth, uh, which your current role focuses on. Um, uh, so my question is, what do we as peacemakers need to be aware of in terms of our of making our restorative practices with the earth as diverse and inclusive as possible? Oh, good question. I think this will just be like a meandering of my thoughts, so just go with me. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when, when I hear the term reconciliation is the, the fourfold approach. That, that many organizations adopt, you know, of let, let looking at being reconciled with self, reconciled with God, reconciled with the planet and reconciled with others. And for me, there's something beautiful, truly beautiful in that holistic conceptualization of reconciliation. And because all of this is always this and this and, um, and there's something really lacking in that we jump to reconciliation without doing the deconstruction, without doing the decolonization. So for me to be reconciled with myself, I have to recognize that I'm an individual who has been formed and co-opted and imbued with values and constructs and concepts from a white supremacist, white patriarchal, neoliberal, colonialist world. I have to check myself for my classism, my sexism, my internalized racism, my internalized ableism. And happy to pick that up when we talk about COVID, but ableism is fascinating to look at in this, you know, in these times. <laughs> so interesting. Um, so I think for me, like before we even talk about reconciling with the earth, I'm like, okay, reconciling with self requires doing deep work. It requires doing decolonial, deconstructive work. No one wants to do it. Because it's hard. It is hard, especially in the West where we have got this notion of I'm the master of my own fate and I, I make my own choices. No, sugar, no. You know, we're, we're, within, we're in a system. We're born in a system. We're born in a system and we're breathing air. And if we're not even going to stop and check what are the molecules I'm breathing in that's going and penetrating into my very DNA, into my very character, into my very being, into my pores, and then it's coming back out through my breath. If I'm not willing to do that work, then what possible chance have I got of reconciling to anyone else if I don't even reconcile to myself? That's hard work, that's long work, that's deep work, but it is transformative, I believe. 
in terms of then yeah like linking that to then okay if you're of a faith or if you're of a belief in some some system some relationship with a being to decolonize and deconstruct okay what comes to mind when i say the word god how often is that a white male image how often is that that concept you know white patriarchally infused how often do the values that I impose in peace building and reconciliation, and how often are they Victorian? How often are they English? And definitely in terms of reconciling with the earth, I think the first thing is recognizing that, you know, so much of this work is being written, is being crafted, is being honed. The program has been created by white people, by people who are operating in a whole different cultural milieu. People for whom peace looks like one thing and then exporting that to countries where peace looks like a different thing. So I'm in an inter, inter-race marriage and I know that like for my husband to be in my family at our dinners, it's like, this isn't peaceful. Whereas we're all at peace because we love the chaos. We love the color and the vibe and the atmosphere and the noise and the energy. That's, that's peace, that's everything. So even just to recognize what are our constructs of peace that we're then exporting. Um, but with the earth, recognizing that we in the West don't know shit. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> reconciling with the earth isn't building a veg box, Sarah, on your balcony. <laughs> like, no, sugar, it's not going to your zero waste. Like, Ghana doesn't need zero waste stores because that's just called living you know we don't need to be taught how to conserve water because water comes from a bucket and you just pour in as much as you need for your bath so i'd love to see reconciliation peace building with the earth work that truly looks to learn from majority world countries because we're the ones who don't have it right we're the ones who are who are messed up we're the ones who are divorced from the world we're the ones who are fractured I'd love to see earth reconciliation work that truly genuinely goes to other places, goes to majority world brave places and just shuts up, looks and learns. Mm, yeah. Wow. Thank you. That's such a, such a right challenge. Um, you kind of alluded this in what you just said, you talked about how peace looks different in lots of different ways. So can we just, for a second zero in on when we talk about conflict transformation and when we're doing peace building work and reconciliation work and um if we i'm just imagining like i in my community reconciliation work right i go in with my idea of this is what this is what conflict looks like this is what it feels like and then this is what peace looks like and this is what it feels like and you've just said actually for lots of different cultures and people conflict looks different, peace looks different. So what do we need to know as peacemakers about our frameworks of conflict transformation? Oh gosh, I, it's, it's interesting to noting, noting for myself, even if you ask that question, I feel my immediate reaction was, oh, I'm not qualified to answer that because I'm not a peace builder. I'm not someone whose job title has peace builder. I don't manage a peace building program. And then I just caught myself and was like, hold up, Natalia, you're a woman of color. Like peace building is what you've done your whole life because I live in a white supremacist culture. And also in diversity and inclusion work, yeah, like by any other name, you could just call it peace building work. You know, so much of diversity and inclusion work is whew, helping brown and black people to make peace with themselves, with their identity, when they've been told directly and mostly indirectly and insidiously they've been told that they're less than they've been told that they're not right they've been told their very identity is wrong and dangerous and ugly so there's peace building at all levels of diversity and inclusion work and then obviously the systematic level of looking at how our very laws our legal constructs the way that we raise our children the way that we have the curriculum the way that we please school rules every layer of society is 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 imbued with white supremacy it's it's unequal and inequitable to people of color and, and poor people people who have been impoverished by by society so <laughs> answering your actual question becca um i think 
<laughs> I think the, the, a huge thing for me in, in conflict transformation was just like, wait, wait, stop. And listen. Um, that's a song, isn't it? Stop, collaborate and listen. Vanilla Ice. Okay. You didn't think you'd get that little rap thrown in for free, this, this TED Talk. Um, <laughs> I think there is something about just shutting up and listening and asking communities, asking people, what is peace? What is, what is peace to you? Because, you know, there's something, again, very uncomfortable for me. And I'm operating in a, in a majority Christian space and seeing that, that in, in white Christianity, and that's what it is, it's white Christianity, it's English Christianity, it's Victorian Christianity, there's this sense of peace means no disruption. Peace means everything just gets along and, and there's no heads above the parapet and everything's fine. We're all fine. And that is not peace because if you're forcing people to contain themselves, to squish themselves, to pretzel themselves, to operate in your, in your modalities, that's the opposite of peace. Peace to me as a, as a, as a follower of, of, of Christ, as a, as a believer in God and a believer in we all have a spirit within us. There's something about human flourishing, human fulfillment and being the full extent of who you can be and society and, and family and church. I feel like our job is to help people become the fullness of, of who they're meant to be and to be free in accepting and loving and being their full selves. So before anyone wants to go to other countries and tell them about how to be peaceful, I'm like, first of all, what is peace to you? What is peace to them? Have the conversation. And especially, I see this in DNI work, diversity and inclusion work, allow anger, allow anger. People, white people, English people, and I keep saying white people because white people are not used to being labeled by color. And it's interesting, I just invite you, if you're a white person, I invite you to notice your reaction to it. Because I get some very interesting responses in DNI work. Like, people are like, why, why is she saying I'm white? I'm just a person. <laughs> you're a white person. Because you're quick to say the Asian person or the black person or the whatever person. But we don't like anger, and particularly in Western Christianity, which now is global Christianity because thanks colonialism, thanks missionaries, <laughs> um, we're not comfortable with anger and we've wrongly labeled anger unholy. And I wanna be like, wait a second, did you, are you guys reading the same Bible as me? Cause my God is pissed off. My God is pissed off a lot of the fucking time. Jesus got violent, Jesus got angry, Jesus threw himself on the floor and cried. Jesus has the whole spectrum of human emotions. And then you're going to come and tell me, oh, I shouldn't be an angry black woman. We should make up, we should reconcile. And we shouldn't express our anger. Like we need to get past that and go to forgiveness. Like forgiveness is justice. Like let's not divorce charity, inclusion and reconciliation. Let's not divorce these huge things from justice and you can't bring about justice if you're not angry about injustice yes i feel like you just took us to church for a minute thank you <laughs> <laughs> um i want to give time for a group discussion but two two last questions for you so so i'm thinking right now the coronavirus and how this this unprecedented pandemic is bringing up a lot of emotions for people right um mm -hmm a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of anger. And it's, I think it's also hard for us to, well, almost impossible for, for, for us to be mindful about how it's impacting everybody because we are so stuck in our bubbles and, and all that we can know of how it is impacting others is what we you know, see on the media. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts um, about our response to it or how it's impacting different diverse communities if you've heard it through your, your work or through friends or family or, or however, but if you had any thoughts on that, and then I've got one last question after that, and then we'll do group discussion. Sure. Um, it's interesting even you just phrasing it as this unprecedented pandemic, because I just thought like yes and no, it's unprecedented. It's the first truly global, like because of, because of globalization, it's the first time I feel confident saying, like I'm a biologist or something, I feel confident saying it's the first time in human history that it has truly been global. 
but actually aside from the news we don't exist globally you know we exist in what's in our what's in our sphere of control of relation and in that sense it isn't unprecedented you know like people all over the world are dealing with typhoid dealing with malaria dealing with ebola dealing with polio you know dealing with 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 sexual gender based violence like these are real pandemics that people are dealing with every day dealing with poverty dealing with a lack of sanitation so there's something you know, there's something in recognizing that this is new for us. It isn't new for the countries that we impoverished. It isn't new for the countries whose resources we stole, whose infrastructure we dilapidated. We, we you know, we, we kicked them in the leg when we started the race. Um, and interesting, yeah, like looking here, it's, as in all things, in, in a war, in any time that there is a crisis, women and girls, and in particular, women and, and girls in poverty. And within anything, I'm always looking at who's the least powerful in that, in that group. So if you're looking at females, well, then you've got to be looking at, well, well, girls. If you're looking at women and girls, you've got to be looking at, well, black and brown girls. If you're looking at black and brown girls, you've got to be looking at, well, poor black and brown. Then you've got to be looking at those with queer identities, those with disabilities, those um, you know, who exist outside the mainstream, the mainstream, um, like norm they're always going to be the ones who suffer the most and we definitely are seeing that here in England uh, with any crisis those who I mean the luxury of stockpiling just the fucking luxury of it disgusts me and I say that as someone who has it like that I could stockpile if I was inclined to I have a salary I haven't had to worry about my provision this month you know but like people you know people who are living on on 58 pound a week um job job seekers allowance or universal credit whatever it's called um they're not able to buy the nine pack of toilet roll that's not because of covid that's because they can't afford six pounds to spend a week on loo roll they're the people who buy the two that cost three pounds so they're the ones already paying more money <laughs> for an everyday item. They're the ones who can't afford to take advantage of Tesco's three for two offer. Sorry, should I say Waitrose? It's an NGO space, probably Waitrose and Sainsbury's, my bad. I didn't mean to mention Tesco. Stop swearing, stop swearing, Natalia. Do y'all know what Aldi is? Kidding. Um, but you know, they can't afford the luxury of taking advantage of the three for two offers. You know, so already recognizing that's an everyday luxury. COVID and isolation has just shone a light on what was already there. It's a disease that's already in our country anyway. Our country is so flipping inequitable. And now we're seeing it. The fact that food banks are closing, the fact that free school meals are, are not being provided, that to me is, is the tragedy and the travesty of COVID. If it shines a light on the inequity in this country that was already here, hopefully now people see it. But definitely in terms of this survivalist, you know, people of color, people with disabilities, not all, but significantly, they already are operating in this mindset anyway. You know, people who are on zero hour contracts, it's interesting now people who are on fixed term contracts are facing the same insecurity, the same destabilization, but that's how some people live week to week, not knowing if they're going to get a call next week and have work, not knowing if they're going to be able to make rent. So... For me, in terms of COVID, it's an eye opener if people want to fucking see. Yeah. So, uh, what, well, in relation to that, but in everything that you said, the last question that I, I want to ask is what, what takeaway, <laughs> to sum up, <laughs> what takeaway can you leave us with? Like, what is your challenge? I, I think, you know, at Burger Center, we, uh, we're, contemplative activists, right? So mm -hmm. we want to do, we, we are here, we exist to do the inner work of peace building and reconciliation that you're talking about, but we are also, we also want to invite people to take action and put their values into action. Mm -hmm. So my last question, is there some takeaways or some direct action that you feel that you could leave us with to inspire us with? No pressure. Um, I love that balance of contemplation and action and yeah, I, I can definitely like relate to that. I think again, being being someone who's other and being someone who I love Taze, I love meditation, I love peace, I love silence, I love silent retreats. 
and I'm someone who is righteously angry and noisy and passionate. So I definitely invite people to, to lean into discomfort and I would invite people to look at, so say if, like Dee and I, if we're going to look at our social spaces, you know, I've got to look at who's formed me, what's formed me, how am I formed? And that's internal work that requires me looking at who do I lean towards when I'm in a conference or if I'm going, if I'm at lunch, I mean, back, back when I was allowed out the house, you know, back when I was allowed with other human beings, <laughs> you know, I had to, to check myself continually, like, who do I lean towards when I start a call? Of course, when I go on a, a retreat, if I'm in a, in a session, if I'm in a conference, who do I naturally want to lean to? And just catching myself of like, why am I keen to go towards that person? Is it because they're like me, they're similar to me? What is on my Netflix playlist? What is on my bookshelf? Like, when you start looking, when you start seeing with that inclusion and diversity lens, I think it's so, so valuable because then you start realizing much as I do, of I'm like, okay, most of the people, like most of the Christian authors on my shelf are white men or white women. Well, what's that about Natalia? Like go beyond that. So a challenge or an invitation, I think challenges are just invitations, inviting people to say, what's the peace building work you could do within yourself? you know, where are you not at peace? And I don't mean feeling nice. I don't feel mean feeling peaceful. That's not true peace. I mean, making peace with, with parts of yourself and definitely looking at your relationships. You know, one thing I'm really keen on is visual diversity as a clue about someone's life. And one of my favorite pastimes when I'm looking at people in DNI is I'll just check out an Instagram feed. And I've, I've literally worked with, with, a, with a white woman um, in DNI. I mean, I've worked with many, many, many white women in DNI, of course. Um, <laughs> Y'all love it. Um, but scrolling through an Instagram and be like, wow, I've scrolled through 50 people before I found a black friend. And this is the woman who was leading diversity and inclusion work. So I would invite you to look at your own, like scroll through your own Instagrams. Who are you spending time with? Who's influencing you? Who are you being molded by? And in turn, who were you influencing? Who were you molding? And definitely raise this in your organization and push for DNI work and inclusion work to be funded. Push for it to be centralized, push for it to be mandatory, because anything that's optional, you don't value it. Once, once things are legal, once there's a safeguarding issue, oh, everyone has got to do their safeguarding. Everyone had to do GDPR, or you would be locked out of your email account. So organizations where people can make things mandatory when they value it so i would be asking you to push and it's not about having to say oh this isn't my work everyone's work is diversity and inclusion work that's my challenge thank you very very much and thank you for setting uh the tone for a brave space um and for your honesty and candor i really appreciate that so I want to open it up to the rest of the participants. Um, so I just want to uh, reiterate that this is a kind space, a brave space, one with empathy. I invite you to share your, your honesty, your experiences, and to ask a question for Natalia or to share something that you have that you want to say. Um, and we're going to offer our attention and listening to people who share uh, with, with empathy and with kindness. But please, anyone feel free. Uh, is it possible? So can I ask a question? Yes, go for it, Caroline. Really, really, you say that. Um, as a disabled woman, um, I'd like to hear you maybe talk a bit more about ableism. Mm -hmm. I, I, I trained as a environmental scientist and ended into environmental management as a master's. Um, and then did some research into volunteer tourism. It was really interesting to hear what you were saying at the beginning about people going off, environmental behaviour, going off and volunteering on people rather than with people in, in certain countries. And my perspective was looking at why to save people from a marine conservation point of view, because I was, I was a scuba diver. Why disabled um, divers weren't getting more involved in marine conservation work, which there were some obvious reasons why, but also it was really, hard, really interesting to explore that. It came, I came back, it came back to what obviously was going on in on the home countries, host countries. And so then got really heavily involved in accessible, inclusive volunteering. This is over about 20 years now. 
and um, it's really interesting how things ebb and flow and go around in circles. Um, I'm 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 still in in that kind of inclusive volunteering um, research background, uh, and I just and also what you were saying about the crisis of the, the virus and people is un, it's really interesting to see it underlying perceptions come out and hidden biases and i've been i've been challenging that on on twitter and other other spaces as well um i just sorry i'm rambling now but I, i'll be interested oh, it's interesting to explore, explore that because i i think uh the last couple of weeks but this has come up has really actually really scared me about the number, amount of ableism um and i was really took strength from things that tanny grace thompson said in, in the house of lords this week and I, I think things are pushing she's pushing things back but i think it's still a long way to go and it does feel like we've undone some of the stuff where i thought we were achieving in the last 20 years and it feels like it was maybe superficial on the surface it made me kind of look and realize that so um in the sphere with, of reconciliation i was just wondering if we could explore that just a little bit thank you thank you um no yeah thanks for, for bringing bringing that point in thank you so much um so i am in so in like i feel like in every area of my life i'm someone who op operates in two different spheres so i am disabled i have a hearing loss that's why i'm like doing this um so i'm partially deaf and i have fibromyalgia which is a chronic pain and energy um affecting condition um so i can walk and i present normally and look fabulous but also then there's a hidden pain that i'm carrying so definitely covid has shone such a light on on ableism in our culture and i think we're seeing that in in multifaceted ways so for a start we're seeing people we're seeing the intersection of ableism and capitalism you know of we're in a society where we measure you on your output and if you are not able to output in a way that we want to measure and we're measuring in a very white capitalist way and i definitely found this in my dni work <laughs> this is gonna be a very rambling answer caroline just go with it um but in dni work um particularly in white space i find it so interesting that my way of working as someone who's who's very african in, in many ways is very relational it's about relationships it's not about oh, I'm delivering this by this deadline and this email needs to go out and there needs to be a strategy and a structure and that sort of really white patriarchal capitalist output driven um, modality of working. Um, so it's interesting just even seeing there like the, 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 the outworking of cultural difference and outputs, you know, measurables, capitalism. And if you're not able to perform and have something to show for your work at the end of the day, like we want to see how many words have you typed or how many Excel, Excel um, you know, numbers have you formulated, how many physical things have you made? And if you're not able to participate in that structure, then you're deemed as, as a leech in society. And you know, even just using the term disabled is, 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 is controversial and we discuss this in my work of, we use the term disabled, but we use it in the active term of society has disenabled me from participating. I'm now in a space where because my manager understands disabilities, she has enabled me to work and get the best out of me and now I'm performing and slaying and thriving. And it's about, okay, but you're disenabling people from participating and and seeing with covid of how people are reacting and i shouldn't laugh but i but it is a bit funny um how people are like oh my god i'm so isolated i'm stuck at home and i'm like so is every fucking disabled person i know mm. welcome to the club brenda <laughs> um, I don't even know anyone called Brenda the name just came to me. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, any Brenda's out there, my <laughs> Um, but there is something about just recognizing, and I recognize my privilege. Like I am so fortunate, I have a very busy and very active and fulfilling life. But there are times that I have to cancel social plans, I lose money. I spent like 30 quid in taxis in two days because I just couldn't walk enough. I have the privilege through having access to work, which many most disabled people don't. I have the privilege of being able to afford that, but it's like a tax on disability, a tax on me to participate on an equal playing field with non-disabled people is that I then need to give more time, give more energy and give more money to be able to flipping show up and enjoy it. And my enjoyment will be diminished because my body is in pain. So I feel like COVID is definitely showing people a real eye opener about actually who we're isolating, 
who we're not seeing. And if you're not seeing people, they're not included. They're mm -hmm. disempowered from decision making. And I do not trust or feel comfortable in any society where decisions are made almost exclusively by non-disabled middle-class white people. It's, it's frankly dangerous. I don't know if that actually answers your question or not, Carol. <laughs> It's Can I ask something? Oops. Sorry. I was going to say thank you. It's interesting to hear. Um, have been quite triggered with the word vulnerable and most vulnerable because I think we all have something to offer. But yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Maybe can another another session sometime and yeah, unpick the more things. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. I'll let someone else. Um, I need to go. I'm helping out a food project, so I'm going to disappear now. So, but brilliant session. Thank you. You go, girl. So, self-care okay and the next person can i oh yeah Sina. Uh, oh yeah and, and then Hi. serena sorry if i'm saying your wrong, name wrong next serena but Sina, go ahead thank you very much uh so natalia thank you so much for your uh what you said you you expressed so many things that i have felt before but i could never articulate you've articulated things very well for me as a as a person of color as a disabled uh, female over 45 now and on very low income uh it's you've you've really explained what my life looked like and um i've got a very direct question i am um, so i am part of several um bame networks in different places of work because i have like zero hour contracts and uh, I have been uh, so I, I really appreciated what you what you said about making peace with yourself. Yeah. This is something I feel I need to work on, but I don't know which avenues. Like you, I like what you mentioned. I'm I'm keen on meditation and prayer, and you know, I have my own spiritual uh, practice that I try to practice uh, on a daily basis, but. Um, I also, you know, I also suffer a lot from uh, isolation and um, and basically I've joined a few uh, BAME networks uh, in my in my place of work and uh, because I'm passionate, I'm very, very passionate, uh, very angry about injustice, um, especially social injustices done through uh, lack of access to work, you know, for people, for people like me, and I always look at the most vulnerable. I don't, I don't really get impressed when I see a person of color who gets a point as a CEO or something, because a lot of the time that's just, you know, like the, the exception rather than the rule. And I, so uh, basically, I've been treated a bit like a, like a paria, you know, in those networks. I, I have felt really othered, and it's really broken my heart. And I liked what you said about look at yourself when, you know, who do you go towards? Who do you, you know, uh, who do you tend to, to go towards? Because the question that comes to me is like, Sina, should you actually recoil from these circles? Because obviously it's, it's very detrimental for me to be searching for peers and finding even more um, people giving me a vibe that I'm not good enough, that, you know, English also is not my first language, even though I speak it very well. And, you know, that I'm not appropriate, I don't present appropriate, I don't, you know, or I'm, you know, I'm definitely not someone who's going to go and be uh, doing any of the active work, talking to HR or something like that, you know, they would keep me back because I'm like a, almost a, a liability that's what i see reflected in people's eyes and these people are my shade and it really breaks my heart and there's a part of me that's like shall i just go away and actually just write blog posts and stay on my own and give up on on having a circle of friends and peers and networks or shall i push forward and share what i'm feeling because i tell you what i've finished on this i've written one blog post and no one wants to publish it they do not want to publish this blog post because it, it, to them it sounds like too ranty. No one has said things like that to me directly, but I now know how the, the Brits, you know, like I can translate what, you know, people say in what it actually means. 
And so I'm really looking at blogging and putting my own voice out there because I'm kind of sick of it now. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. Sorry, I've taken a bit of time. Thanks, Sina. Please do not apologise. Instead, thank you for sharing. Like you really owned the values of vulnerability and sharing and being brave and entering into this space. So thank you, Sina. Um, I, I, I actually think that what you shared is so valuable because it highlights the fact that actually this work is costly for women of colour. Mm. You know, this work is costly in a way that you can't measure. You cannot account for it in a job description or in a personal spec. But this is costly because this is work that actually goes straight to my soul and, and working into diversity inclusion has been costly for me emotionally with the cost, the bill of lading that this work required was a pound of flesh and more flesh and it kept asking for flesh and it would be so easy to give up and step out of that space. So it is costly and, and white people in particular need to understand the cost that we are asking of because I say we when I'm talking about black and when I'm talking about white because I'm both mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we need to understand the cost that we are that we're demanding that we're expecting of people to teach because this work is about our identity um, and when you are like when you raise the point there of, of, of like yeah like fitting in the BAME space and fitting in the BAME networks and, and the type of people who own who own these networks and I think I think what that's getting at is the whole notion and the, and the construct that's so prevalent and so dangerous of respectability politics. You know, lots of, you know, that's a, that's a huge thing in, in, in black feminist circles. And we look at it, say like, you'd look at it with like, say Barack and Michelle Obama of like, they're the right kind of black, you know, because, and we see this again, like we see it with gender respectability of how often are the, is the white woman CEO, just the fucking same as the white man CEO, but she has longer hair and her name's, you know, Jane, or whatever, <laughs> like, but for all intents and purposes, their experience, their culture, their manners, their way of approaching systems and people and problem solving, that is all the same construct. That is still that patriarchal, um, neoliberal, capitalist construct that's perpetuated, but now with a vagina. Like, and that's not even to say that all women have vaginas, because many women do not. Mm. Um, but I think there's definitely something there about respectability politics and who is it as, as a black person, as a person of color, who was respectable enough, you know? Do they speak so well? Essentially, are they my shade and do they speak like me? And I have to check myself with that. And for me, it's definitely a thing of like using my privilege because I can walk into a CEO and chat to him. I can speak in a way that I'll be heard because my received pronunciation is probably fucking better than his. And I've been to university more times than him. But I had to go more because I'm a brown woman anyway, so I need more qualifications to even get half the job. So I think that's a really, really valid point of, of just sharing with people in their space that people of colour are carrying a lot of burden. Mm. Working and living in these spaces is costly. It is so, so tiring. The editing and the containing I do on a daily basis. If you could harness the energy that black people are containing all day, mm. We would have like no need for nuclear fusion, nuclear energy, no need for gas or electricity. You could just power the world on the energy of people of color containing themselves. Yeah. So I think it's a really valuable point. So, you know, I'm happy to pick it up with you one-to-one yeah. -one in terms of how do you navigate? Do you stay and stay in spaces or do you leave? And for me, there's definitely something about if you're staying, then check yourself. How do you manage it? How do you prepare? What's your network? What's your safety? And when is the price too much to pay? And that's an individual and none of us should judge where that line is for different people. Yeah, thanks, Natalia. Yeah, and I can do, I can link people that have had questions and permit me to send emails and I can do that. That's no problem. Raina had a question next. And then also if anyone has a burning question, because we have about 10 minutes left, if anyone has a burning question, put it in the chat box and we'll make sure um, just to give enough time. Serena, go ahead. Cool. Um, hey, Natalia, I just want to say like absolutely nailed it. Um, so thank you for that. I coordinate a space um, called Diaspora Dialogues for the Future, so it's a POC only space. It was previously a POC centred space, um, but just after a few difficulties we decided to make it strictly a POC only space. Um, and it's a holding and healing space where we gather to share about our experiences in regards to race, especially in relation to ecology, sustainability, climate change, whatever you want to call it, um, relating to our communities or ancestry, 
our experiences and our beliefs and often we talk about how there's this claim of you know we are all one we are all one we're all one human we're all like um on the planet and i find that really harmful because nobody wants to look at the power dynamics within we and then suddenly there's a claim of like them and us and oh, we don't want to go into division it's not actually calling out it's not actually being divisive in my eyes i see it as as audrey lord says you know define and empower and um recognize what's actually separating us of being all one or whatever that oneness is and who defines the oneness and i'm actually having that difficulty especially in climate change spaces or sustainability spaces and specifically spiritual spaces um though i guess um seeing as this is quite a spiritual interfaith peacemaking space um is there anything you'd like to say to that as well and how do we get past that and move forward yeah no, thank you so much for raising that that's one of the discussions that i had had with becca in our prep course and, and forgot to mention thank you um but there's yeah there's such a huge issue in in faith spaces but even just more broadly oh sina honey you need to mute your mic again love oh, sorry um that's all right um there's something so insidious and it's almost like it's, it's silencing it's dismissive when people say oh but we all we all bleed the same color we all bleed red we're all one we're all human there's only one race the human race and you know to me that's just another variation of saying i don't see color i'm like how how lucky for you because my employer does um and particularly in church i've operated in church spaces faith spaces and the silencing of but we're all one in Christ. It's dangerous. It's, it's dismissive. It's undermining because my experience is not that we are all one in Christ. My experience is that yes, I'm one with the Lord and, and mother God loves me just as I am. And mother God is, is the United Colors of Benetton, but I live in a world where mother God is not in charge. I live in a world where white men are predominantly in charge, where white women are next in line to be in charge, where light skinned, brown men and you know like that's the world in which I operate so to me it's about okay let's hold the duality of yes in in faith in our identity as human beings we all have the same beautiful worth and lights and that is integral and true and pure and good and that's what I want us to get towards honoring and we exist and operate in a space which is fundamentally intrinsically unequal in its very DNA and the church is unequal in its very DNA. The church has built its prophets on slavery. Like, come on. The church is built on this Victorian white philanthropic model of we, we with, the, with the resources are helping those without the resources. So it's, it's integrally us and them already. It's just done from their position of power, or should say our position of power, of we have they don't, we will be benevolent and Christ-like and share and give. That automatically already is recognizing that there's a difference, that there's an inequality, that there's an us and them. And then it's ironic that like you say, then when you do raise it as a, oh, there's us, there's them, it's like, oh, you're being divisive. You don't need separate groups. You don't need a separate people of color group. That'll be divisive. It'll raise negative feelings. No, 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 the feelings are there. They're there anyway. What you're doing when you make separatist spaces is you're enabling me to have a place of safety. I can feel safe. I, I, I operate right now in a, I thought, I thought my last place of work was really white. And then God was like, ha no, I see you and I raise you, ha, <laughs> lol. Um, so operating in a fundamentally white middle-class English, English, soft, nice space, it's unsafe. You know, fundamentally it's unsafe. And by that, I don't mean it's dangerous. That's not the opposite. You know, it, it's not like, I'm not saying it's a dangerous space, I'm saying it's not a, a place. And by safety, I mean, I don't mean like physical safety or anything like that, thankfully, but by safety, I mean, safety to me implies that you can be yourself, you don't have to watch your tongue, and there's no consequence of doing so. Essentially, it's privilege. You know, safety is a privilege if you can just speak and you don't have to edit yourself. You don't have to catch every word and think about how this might land, how this might make me be seen. Uh, a privilege is, you know, for, for white people in particular, not having to worry about straightening your hair. Or do I go for that job interview with 
with with afro hair or will it be deemed unprofessional when i like the angry black woman there are all these layers of otherness that we need to consider having a person of color only space is a space where i can just breathe and just not have to edit everything i say not have to think oh wait if I wear my hair like that, will I be seen a certain way? Will that mean that that person doesn't listen to me? Will it undermine the work I'm here to achieve and to represent and get done? So I should wake up half an hour early and straighten my hair. And I should wear like, you know, a karma, a karma top, a more beige top. Like they're all the layers of othering that we're, that we're having to operate in. So I don't even know if that's an answer to your question. I'll feel like you go and carry on and crack on. And self-care. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, also, like I, I feel like a lot of people have experienced it, not only coming from white people, but also um, people yeah. of colour as well, yeah, yeah. which is Each other, we really, really counterproductive <laughs> um, sometimes. And it's just really hard to see um, what enables what enables that to, that to happen, I guess. Yeah. And yeah. that's where that work of decolonising ourselves and recognising how we are in the same way that so many women, you know, we're the ones policing each other, we're the ones slut shaming each other, we're the ones sizes, you know, being sizes to each other. Mm. You know, and that is, that's colonialism's legacy. You know, they've left Africa and Africa is now, you know, the African church is now more homophobic and more sexist than it was before white people came. And the white person isn't even there anymore. <laughs> but the legacy of it, the polluting of the mind and the way that those cultural norms are just being perpetuated. So you're not only having to fight off what's coming at you from, you know, from white people in power, you're also having to fight off what's coming from your own mum and dad and your own aunties and uncles and your own sisters and brothers who are policing you. So that decolonizing work is a multifaceted, holistic piece of work. Um, just thank you, Natalia. And just for time's sake, I just want to get to Alex, who said that he had something. And um, Serena, you have a question here to, to share uh, the Diaspora Dialogues for Future. Um, so let's go to Alex and we'll wrap up um, right after Alex. Go ahead. Uh, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for this space. Um, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, and I just wanted to share, Natalia, what um, I felt uh, my reaction was when you um, were labeling the white or the whiteness, mm -hmm. and um, I felt I felt threatened. That was that was the feeling that that I had, and I think there's something really valuable in in that feeling and really experiencing that feeling um, as a white person, and um, using using that label as a tool. Um, and I also want us to think about if in responding to the crisis um, by using these labels uh, of whiteness if we are perpetuating the, um, this kind of echoes, echoes what um, you two were just discussing, uh, if we're perpetuating the um, identity politics that, um, that uh, is, is a legacy, legacy of, of what we're, we're working through. Um, and maybe we can think about whiteness as uh, a grander concept um, that really uh, permeates each of us because I am, you know, I am the, co uh, the colonizer, but I am also the colonized. Uh, my ancestors colonized me um, uh, and they colonized themselves when they um, decided, to, um, uh, decided to be forceful, you know, use, use uh, Newtonian styles of, um, of, of interaction. Um, and so I just wanted to share that. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, I don't. I don't think labeling is like perpetuating things in a negative way. I think for me, yeah. I would just. I would invite you. Like, if you know, if we were introducing our friends, I rarely hear white people describe their white friends, but I'll hear them say, "Oh yeah, my friends. Oh yeah, she's Indian or she's brown." And for me, it's okay. So let's just introduce everyone's race because we need to make sure that people understand that race is something that affects every human being. We all have a racial identity. White people have had the privilege of not having to have an identity because they're the norm. And for me, it's actually okay if we're not acknowledging that, then we're, we're just yoking that on people of color. We're yoking it as their issue and the beauty and the invitation for me, for everyone here, particularly white people is lean into diversity and inclusion spaces, lean into race issues 
staying away is a luxury that people of color don't have. I've known what my color was from as soon as I can think because I had to be aware of it because I operated in a white space, the only um, non-white person with my brother in my school. So for me, it's like, okay, lean in, just lean into it more and, and definitely, yeah, check when you feel threatened, when you feel vulnerable, check that emotion and lean the fuck into it. That's my parting words from Natalia now that that's because <laughs> I'm really professional. <laughs> Yeah, no, but that is, that is a great, it is a great invitation for us to end on that we all are leaning in. And um, Natalia and Nana, I'm just so grateful for you for, for spending this time with us. Um, St. Ethelberger's is on a journey of unlearning and uh, this has been really, really eye-opening for me personally. And we look forward to hosting more conversations and curating more brave spaces like this. I'll be sending the link out to people for this recording if you want to share it. Also, if you want to um, you know, email me to pass on your details or to ask further questions, um, I'll, I can pass those on to Natalia Nana if that's okay with you. Um, so you can just go ahead and email me and I'm just very grateful for you all showing up. Thank you so much for being a part of this and we have more future events coming up in the future. So please do keep checking our links for that. Thank you. Thank Last you. Thanks to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia Nana. Appreciate it. Take care. My Thank pleasure. You. Bye y'all. Bye. Stay